Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to the end of Oculus Connect 6, day two. We hardly knew yet. I know, we had to do another episode of projections because on this day we actually got to use mm -hmm hand tracking, as well as go back and do it more with Oculus Link, yeah. chat with some more people, play some more games. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's kick off with our hand tracking demo, because we right. learned a lot. Yes, we did. So we, we were able to go into what they are calling Elixir. Now this is, I didn't know if this would be a tech demo. This is apparently a game that everybody will be able to play one day. This will be out on the Quest Store whenever hand tracking launches next year. And in this game you go, you're basically in a cauldron surround, you know, you're not in a cauldron, you're surrounded by cauldrons and various witches things and wizard things and you can walk around and reach your hand out and engage with the environment. The first thing you do is put your hand down on a platform and it changes the color of your hand. Mm. Now, now just from a starting point, I had a funny experience because the first thing they tell you to do is walk forward and I'm thinking, well, I mean, I don't have my controllers. How am I supposed to walk right. forward? And obviously, yeah. like, this is the stupidest thing ever. I've been doing VR for like five years. I should know I'm supposed to physically walk forward. I had a very similar thing <laughs> because at these conventions, they give you demos and someone puts a headset on you and they tell you to stick your hand out so they can put the wrist straps around right. you for the touch yeah. controllers. And so you're waiting like and a I robot. I instinctively put my hands out yeah. for the touch controllers, but of course, you don't have to because it recognizes your hand. Right. Now, the way they're doing this is also interesting. We learned a bunch about the technology for the hand tracking. It's not using you know, IR sensors, it's using computer vision, mm -hmm. detecting the edges of your hand and doing a skeletal model. They say each hand will have about 25 points of articulation. So 25 points so you can have multiple different poses. For the skeletal modeling. For the skeletal yeah. modeling of the hand, which isn't like a technical limit. It's not like this is the most points. It's, it's enough. Just based on the actual skeleton of your hand, right. it's enough to get all those different poses. Now I had to be cued by the director in order to actually start playing that witch's game because all I wanted to do was play with the play with the tech and yes. see if I could break it. Yeah, yeah, and, we want to break it immediately. And I got to tell you, like this is early still, but uh, it is easily breakable. Like the occlusion is much more real for the hand tracking than it is for touch controllers. Yes. And they just haven't gotten to the point yet where they're able to do that predictive modeling of where is it going if they don't see it. I'm sure that that's coming, but currently if you hold your hand out like this, um, I should say with a single hand, this type of occlusion works very well. Yeah. Like I didn't see any errors there whatsoever. It can't see these fingers, but it does interpret where they should be. If I put another hand behind, if I put another hand behind this hand according to where these cameras are, it loses this hand entirely. This mm -hmm. will fade out. And that fade out is I think is a really smart thing they're doing. I think at every frame, they have a confidence level for how well they think their system is modeling your hand. And so like you said, when you are blocking your own fingers, mm -hmm. the skeletal model is still they're pretty confident Confident they know where the fingers are, so it won't it won't break the system. Right. And then if you block, or if you do things like I tried smacking my hands together, try interlacing mm -hmm. the fingers. I was told that's coming. That is right. I, I was told that that is on its way. That that is something that they can definitely solve. Yes, but if they're not confident, then it fades it away. It won't kind of like throw the skeletal model in all sorts of places. Another interesting thing they do is they have a, a hidden calibration technique. At least in this game demo, in the elixir, where you said the right. first thing you do is you put your hand over these stones mm -hmm. right in front of you. Well, what it's actually doing while you're doing that is it's calibrating because that's the sweet spot for where the lens is see the stereo overlap, mm -hmm. right? Because everyone's hands are made different, right. right? Different sizes, different shapes, different colors. And so when you have this overlap between the two stereo lenses in mm -hmm. the front, right in that middle sweet spot, putting your hands out there, they're gonna then make sure it maps That's to your hand. That's the perfect position for them to be able to uh, detect depth Yes. how far your you know your hands out are away from your eyes mm -hmm. and so that when you move them out here they can do better interpretation of where they are in Z space. Right, right. So even if you have one hand off the side and you see it within the field of view it's still going to be there even though it's outside that sweet spot for depth mapping for stereo overlap right. because they can still tell based on the, how physically big it is right. like that's your hand is still there. I was actually very impressed by the tracking volume because I expected like touch controllers I get because they have the LEDs all around them, they go beyond the visible uh, cone of vision, you know, the field of view, um, so that you can move your controllers and they never, you never see them stop, right. right? Like you can lose the tracking volume back here, but you don't see that. Same thing with, with hand tracking. I expected it to be narrower. I, I would have perfectly forgiven them if the hand tracking kind of ended out here, but no, it's the same thing. You move your hands if they're out of the, you know, your field of vision. Um, it does lose tracking out there, obviously, but uh, you don't see that. It's, they do a perfect model of it all the way across the full field of view. And of course, once you have the hands 
in the virtual world, you know, there's a whole different paradigm of interaction models. There are no more other buttons, right? So there aren't any, at least in this demo, virtual objects that you're picking right. up because you don't get the haptic feedback. So we chatted with the engineers and designers and talked about the solutions that they've come up with. Mm -hmm. And they talk about passive haptics. Passive well, haptics. Passive haptics include what your your actual hands itself. So right. they have one gesture that they're kind of building in, which is like the, the click is the pinch gesture mm -hmm. because you are feeling your own fingers. You have passive haptics there. It seems like developers may have access to that as an event, mm -hmm. like as a pinch event. But they also know where your arm is. So theoretically in the future, you could have passive haptics by tapping Th your that wrist. That is not at launch. Not just at to launch, be clear. but things that they are thinking about. Yes, he said you're on the right track. And yeah. that's, that's absolutely true. I, I would love for that to be the case more uh, and more because the whole problem with touch, and, and hand tracking is great, but People are so used to using controllers that I think they're going to take for granted the, the fact that you don't actually get any haptic feedback, yeah. even passive haptic feedback from a button press. I'm not talking about rumbling. I'm just talking about the act of pressing a button that has an end to the throw. That's something we take for granted. We've taken for granted since the Atari. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that with hand tracking. And people are just instinctively going to want to put buttons in the air and make things that you can engage with and grab. And that's not going to feel right. So I think developers are going to go through a whole new learning phase about what works and what doesn't with hand tracking. Uh, one thing I'll also notice is that my I, I felt like I was jumping back to four years ago and using something like touch for the first time, hand presence for the first time, mm -hmm. where I had un almost unrealistic expectations of interaction, what I could do. There's a virtual character in this Elixir demo, like a, a character, and I, all I want to do is pet its head and rub its yeah. belly because my hands were there and I was getting, I was seeing my fingers there, right. more so, more of a hand presence than I would get with touch controllers. And so Bestly. my expectation was that I would be able to interact more with those objects. Yes. But I, you know, that wasn't built in, so developers will have to reconcile that as well as they're designing these interaction models. Right. I, I think that there is definitely, like you said, a, a higher degree of presence, of hand presence, because the, your, your fingers are modeled and you see them move when you move. And it's going to be wonderful for you know, people who maybe they're not in it for the games. They're yeah. in it for some productivity reason in the future that where we're doing more productivity in VR or for training exercises. If you're learning how to use a console and there happen to be big buttons on it, um, th there is an, one of the demos that they showed is basically a training exercise for somebody who's looking for water damage in the right. house. And right. that's like a good example of something very simple where you're going around and you're pressing, you're pointing at things. Like, As opposed to in traditional VR, grabbing a handle and opening a, a right, cabinet, exactly. it's just tap to open yeah. because you can't grab to open right now. It's So it's very you know user friendly. It's mm -hmm. very newbie friendly. Yeah, yeah. And, and intuitive right. as, as well. And you know what? This is a good point to, to point out that when your hand disappears, there's an element of it's, it still tracks. Like I was surprised by how quickly it could reacquire my hands once mm -hmm. it lost tracking. In that demo where you're pressing the buttons to open the cabinets and close them, I, I was losing due to, you know, um, occlusion. Yeah. occlusion. And I was still able to do those things. Yeah. I was still able to press even though my hand had vanished. So it's clearly reacquiring before they're re-implementing the graphics. And we're, we did our whole gamut of tests. We tried to do the Vulcan salute. We tried to do yeah. you know single finger salute and all that stuff. <laughs> right. and, and most of that stuff did work. Hey, like this stuff, it's solid. Yeah. Very, very impressive. And now also interestingly is that they may be thinking of this for UI, for maybe mm. the home, right? Mm -hmm. Not just in-app experiences, they showed a couple seconds of what it would look like in the, the shell, in the home environment. Mm -hmm. And right now we have laser pointers with Oculus Touch. We're mm -hmm. very comfortable holding that up, laser pointer. How do you do a laser pointer right, in, in hand tracking? Right. Well, they have an example where they then take your arm and they project a beam essentially from your arm so you're, wherever you're kind of pointing, no matter where your, how your wrist is bent, mm -hmm. that's where the laser point would be. And then you do the pinch to click. Really? And then a long pinch would be a long click or something. I'm sure developers are going to try a thousand things and they'll totally. land on the right one. But also, you could do a gun thing if yeah, you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, it changes your relationship with how far objects are away. When we have laser mm -hmm. pointers, like we do with touch controllers, you don't necessarily need to go up to things and grab things. Mm -hmm. You know, you're kind of pointing and, and pulling things over right. and pointing. If you don't have that ability and you're forced to go up, then mm -hmm. it is making more use of 
right. space and, and positional tracking. Although, like we were saying before, when it comes to hand tracking, because you lack the haptic feedback of actually feeling objects, doing things virtually from a distance might actually be the better solution in terms mm. of not breaking the illusion. Like yeah. I, I think levitating things like force powers, or right. like I said before, the Doctor Strange kind of thing, yeah, where yeah. you're mystical and you're not physically touching anything, you're making things happen. Uh, I think that kind of thing is going to lend itself well to VR. There's like a interface. A near infinite number of poses you could do with yeah. 25 track points mm -hmm. per hand. None of which that run out of battery too. And that's the other thing. They're really proud of the fact that they could use extra DSP overhead and yep. just a little bit of the CPU to calculate the hand tracking. They're saying it's going to cost eight minutes of a full charge? Yeah, exactly. If you use hand tracking as opposed to touch controllers and you ran a side-by-side -side in their test, you would lose about seven minutes, seven, eight minutes of battery life, right. which they're really, really proud of. Now, currently with that implementation, they're also tracking at 30 FPS. And so we did see latency as I move my hands yeah, yeah, yeah. fast left and right. It was yeah. a little bit of a I think Carmack, dripping. maybe an 80 millisecond delay too, but they're gonna whittle that down. That's that's the hope you know, yeah. before it comes out next year. And, and this is, you know, it's not replacing touch. I think they right. made it very clear. It's gonna complement that haptics yeah. on a physical controller are mm -hmm. still gonna be very important, but it is essentially a, a free upgrade mm -hmm. uh, for for the Quest users um, and and potentially, hopefully, for Rift users. I mean, it's another option. It's in the toy or tool in the toolbox for developers to use. I, I, you know, it'd be interesting to see how many games actually incorporate it, because I really think you need to make a game from scratch that is for hand tracking. I yes. don't think you're going to see too many games that offer you touch control or hand control, because that's going to be really difficult to solve. Yeah. This whole hand tracking demo was in what they call the innovation area, where mm -hmm. they're running a bunch of experiments, uh, including the, the virtual spaces, the Horizon uh, demo, and also they had a mixed reality demo that was really cool. Yeah, this was this was definitely cool. It did remind me of last year's Dead and Buried experiment, where they there was a you know basically a four v four I want to say mm -hmm. um, you know multiplayer uh, arena scale, <laughs> right? Arena scale Dead and Buried, basically something that you might see on location, um, but it's done entirely in Quest. Um, in that demo last year, there was somebody walking around with an iPad who could actually see into the game world. And right. They could see the players, and the iPad itself was Z positional tracked in that same space that the players were seeing. Uh, what, what that couldn't do was actually incorporate the real world. It was simply a portal into the virtual world. Mm -hmm. What they've done now is they've basically done uh, you know, mixed reality filming purely done in software. So there's no green screen. Uh, there's no added, you know, layering done, compositing done by the game engine. It's just like the iPad is now tracked as it was in, you know, positional space. But now it can, it sees a person, it recognizes that person, and it maps them into the correct, you know, position in yep. Z space, and then surrounds them with the game. It world. does the clipping as right. well, all in real time. Now it's it's rough. I mean, that that clipping, that masking that it does, is definitely you know computer yes, like yes. estimations all over the place. Yeah. But it's good enough. I mean, it looks really cool. And it's doing that with one camera on the iPad right. as well, getting that data, getting the IMU data, sending it back to the headset and then aligning. The mapping, the aligning is spot on. You see a person holding weapons in mm -hmm. Dead and Married. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting was they told us that that rendering is being projected from the headset onto the iPad. Yes. So the headset is actually rendering both perspectives. Two views, in fact, probably three perspectives, because you got left eye, right eye, and also wherever right. the camera yeah. is. So probably not a very poly-intensive, graphically intensive exactly. instance of that Dead and Buried That's not something every game's gonna be able to incorporate. A yeah. lot of games struggle just to incorporate casting, yeah, which right. is a duplication of one of those perspectives. But we totally see this as the future of casting, You know, getting people who are not in VR to understand what people in VR are not only seeing, but yeah. what they're doing. Right. And they can do that in a seamless way with something that a lot of people have it's like a tablet. Could you imagine? I mean, if I if I'm playing it. in VR and you just want to see what I'm doing, even if it didn't do that amazing, you know, compositing, if it just showed you the game world and maybe my avatar in it mm -hmm. by holding your phone up to my space, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's that would be a killer feature for the Oculus yeah. app. No promises as to whether that mixed reality experiment is going to be a shippable product or going to be accessible to developers, but we'd no. love to see that as something that eventually comes. I think VR needs it. Uh, we did get a chance to get into the weeds uh, of the technology of all this stuff mm -hmm. with a conversation with Sean Liu. So we're going to leave you with that, but thank you for watching our coverage. We know we had a lot of VR and AR talk this week, a lot of episodes of projections, and we'll have more impressions of game demos in the future from other demos we did here. Uh, but stay tuned for a chat with Sean Liu.
right, so we are so thrilled. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. Sean Liu is here. Sean, uh, product manager at Oculus. You're the guy we go to to ask the technical question. <laughs> Let's see if I have some answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of announcements uh, at this event, uh, yesterday's keynote. Of course, on the Quest side, we saw there's Link announced, there's a Horizon, of course, hand tracking. Uh, we've used Link, we did the Horizon demo, but we had a lot of questions about all this stuff. Yeah. So let's start off with Link, I guess. Yeah. How, how does this compression work? And, and what, what are the trade-offs that you as an engineering team had to make to get this to run at low latency, to, to choose resolution and performance? It's pretty crazy because we wanted to really enable as much of the Rift experience as possible on Quest. But here you have a device that's really designed for standalone. Uh, it has a different refresh rate, it only goes to 72 hertz, whereas Rift S goes to 80 hertz. And you want things to just look good and feel really good. So there's a number of considerations here. Um, the first really is around resolution, like how much can you get um, into the system. And we actually just use essentially a video pipeline. If you think about it like live streaming a video, mm -hmm. you're taking what comes out on the Rift side, on the PC side, you compress that down, and then you decode that on the Quest side and you replay that. Um, the next consideration that really becomes latency. Now you've got a cable, it's dedicated hardware here, so that really cuts down on a lot of that latency. But you still do get a little bit of issues. And you'll actually notice this if you um, sort of look side to side or move your mm. controllers really rapidly, you'll see a little minor artifacts. And those are things that you know will need probably dedicated hardware on the actual device itself in the long-term future to really get away. But um, on the Quest side right now, it's it's getting really as close as possible. And we're really proud of how far it's come. When you talk about do. those artifacts, that's not video encoding artifacts. Those are time warping artifacts? Or what kind of artifacts are you um, talking it, about? It is sort of that whole pipeline process of doing the encoding, the decoding. And in that time there, now you, know, you do have a little bit of time warp that also happens on both sides. Right. So you get that whole system is really, isn't originally designed for right. plugging that all the way through. And um, because of that, you, do, you notice these, these sort of small artifacts there. Was Link um, always in the picture and it just wasn't ready at launch? How long have you known this was going to happen? It, it, it actually has been an internal discussion for some time. I think um, John Carmack talked a little bit about in his keynote where internally there was sort of a, a question about, could we do this? What's the quality of it going to look like? The original you know, design of the system wasn't designed around this as an initial okay. sort of a core tenant. It was mm -hmm. meant to be standalone, a different class of content, really reducing friction. But there's always this little hope on like, could you use the video encoding and decoding right. pipeline and what could you achieve with that? Um, and so it's pretty remarkable what the team has done there. So it's existing pipeline, it's using of course all the benefits of the architecture of the SOC you're working with. That's and right. that's where John Carver talks about having the cap bit rate at 150 megabits. That's right. That's how you make those trade-offs for resolution and frame rate. Exactly. And the question was like, would it be good enough? And I think mm. after trying on the show floor, hopefully, you know, people will have a really good impression and be able to see for themselves that they think it's good. So t tell me about the cable. I understand yeah. it's five meters it's long? It's five meters long, yeah. OK. And so, it, is it fiber optic inside? It is. Now, you, you really can use any sort of cable you'd want mm -hmm. um, that's USB-C. Um, you can even connect on the other side to you know, USB-A. The, the trick here is actually just a number of considerations. So the first one is that Rift content on Rift S, it's a, it's a five meter cable. So we want people to have the same sort of movement of freedom because content developers are designing around that length. Um, the second big issue really is the bandwidth on the cable itself. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are USB 3, you know, Gen 1 compliant, you're going to be fine. Mm. Not all cables sometimes will hit that spec. And but you can't be five surprised. meters and be compliant with that. So this is where we've done a custom cable just to make sure that, you know, the actual specs of what you see in the throughput are going to be good enough. Got and it. that was really a it's difficult to find a five meter cable right. in market that really satisfies those constraints. Um, and we also think a lot about um, the charging side. So power is a really big issue. And if you're using USB-A to USB-C, you just you don't get all that charging. So we want to just create an option where if your laptop or you know your PC supports USB-C, you can actually get that charging through onto the device. And so those are some of the considerations that led to a, a custom cable. 
we're not wet. Like if you have solutions that work for you or like developers, you know, you don't need that length of a cable. You should definitely use, you know, off the shelf ones. Um, that'll be a lot cheaper and easier. And it sounds like the implementation will be when you plug it in, it will be basically a Rift experience. You see Dash, you see Home, you can yeah. view the, the source, other sources like Steam. That's that right. will all just work out of the box. That's right. We want it to really mirror the Rift platform and experience as it exists mm. today. No differences. We just like we wanted to unlock as much of it as possible. We've heard from a lot of the community that like, hey, you know, I have a Quest device. I think you guys even asked before, like, could this in theory run yeah. Rift content, you know, through that USB port? And so this is trying to deliver on that on that ask to the community. Expands a user base potentially dramatically for those yeah. PC titles. Did you ever consider the wireless approach? Carpac mentioned like things like dedicated dongles with special firmware, like why not wireless now? What do you see as the, the kind of limitations? Yeah, we wanted to start with a tethered approach just because you know, we knew that this is like the highest likelihood of us develop, you know, delivering on a really quality experience. So we're just starting with that first, but we've got exciting things in the works. It sounds like you can incorporate uh, time warp in a way using the wired approach, and, or at least maybe even just being first party in a way that third parties can't. So once you eventually even get to wireless, you'll have that advantage too. That's right. It's it's being able to um, have both the PC side and the standalone side, and then customizing the stacks on both fronts right. to really make this work, I think is yeah. how some of that magic happens. It also sounds like you're taking over completely, you're only doing decoding on the headset, right? And of course, tracking. Yeah. But you're not doing GPU rendering. And is there, does it make any sense to do both remote rendering in combination with local rendering? Or what are the problems with that? It's, it's actually a really nice optimization if you think about like, okay, could we get rid of, say, controller latency and jitter by doing that entirely on the headset and mm -hmm. then rendering a lot of the, the graphic side on the PC. Yeah. The trick here is that you make the developer story really complex, and really oh. complicated, where now as a developer you have to fragment how you actually design your system and do something specifically for the remote rendering pipeline that's different than how you develop the content otherwise. That's a really, you know, costly and expensive and, and complex trade-off for developers. So we decided not to go down that approach just for the sake of the development side. Something that was also surprising to me, and maybe unrelated to Link specifically, is that John Carmack talked about the OLED panel on Quest theoretically could push to, to 90 hertz. Of course, it would void your FCC certification. Now, with that, is that something that was also tested through Link as well, rendering at 90 and pushing it over? We really kept just to the Quest current specs and the 72 hertz side. There's also a lot of other trade-offs you get with the power side, for mm. instance. And so looking at that whole holistically as a system, we're like, let's actually just keep to the Quest hardware specs for now and then just render the content through. But we'll explore it as you know, we get feedback from the community on what things we should tweak or improve on or change. I want to talk about hand tracking. Is that good? Yeah, let's go to hand, hand tracking. tracking. All right. <laughs> yeah, let's so, talk about it. <laughs> this was the big unexpected to me. This was a surprise. Uh, so the fact that you are accomplishing hand tracking at all, given everything the headset's already doing with world mapping and, and controller tracking, however, I did learn today, I think that currently you can't do hand tracking and controller tracking simultaneously. Is that right? That's right. OK. But the hand tracking is fully articulated, 10 digits of my fingers. You're handling occlusion in some respects. How long has that been in development? Has that always been a known? Uh, this has been, you know, a pretty big investment from the organization. Um, actually, it's through Facebook Reality Labs has been working on hand tracking for quite some time. Um, you guys might remember some of the old, I think we did like a blog post on this with a lot of the um, tracked hands with like gloves. Gloves, yes. Yeah. There's a photo um, of Mark Zuckerberg with like doing this. Yeah. This, yeah. Um, a lot of, all of that work is actually foundational and in tying into this whole mm. system. Um, today, actually, we use a lot of those systems for just ground truth tracking. You know, you're, you're not going to get better than having actual fiducials on your hand for tracking than, say, we're using just the Quest black and white cameras there. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get like a, a higher fidelity and resolution than that system. What you can do is actually do combinations where you can do training data, ground truth data using you know, the more robust systems and then use that to really um, train and hone your systems using the Quest tracking cameras. So Carmack mentioned an 80 millisecond uh, latency with hand tracking versus controller tracking, so touch tracking, which is much lower. Is that something that you'll be able to reduce? Yeah, I mean, you also have a chance to try the demo and see for yourself mm -hmm. on how that latency feels. There is some latency, but this is like a continuous work in progress. Got we it. think that there's still room for improvement. So between now and next year when we do the SDK launch, mm -hmm. I think we'll have a lot of and, and that latency is a factor of the frame rate you're capturing 
with the cameras? It's a combination, really, thinking about the whole pipeline of the system. So mm. we're using the inside-out tracking uh, cameras to really just taking those raw frames. Um, and there's really multiple steps here. First, you're trying to just identify where your hands are and sort of do a bounding box. Then you're trying to map out actual features to say, okay, here's roughly where we think you know, key features of the hands are. And you can almost see this like, um, it looks almost like a, a little skeletal with big dots and yeah, lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to map the actual model of the hand on top of that and sort of fit it to that. And so that whole pipeline of getting through there does add some latency, but we'll make improvements. Uh, so I know you can't, as we said, use controllers and hand tracking simultaneously. I know you can't track the controller, but can I use the gyro, the buttons, the, the analog stick in one hand and have my other hand tracked? Um, for now, at the current design of the SDK, they are sort of separated. Got it. Okay. Um, but that's something that we're actually thinking a lot about, um, really on the interaction and design side, about mm -hmm. what is the interplay between your hands and the actual controllers? What does that handoff look like? Like, can you make that actually seamless? So these are all areas for exploration that I think we'll do some cool things I, with. I think the hand tracking is going to be a big development, obviously, or a big you know new toy to play with for developers. What do you think would be some things that they should start with in terms of like early lessons? Uh, from my experience, if I am expected to grab something and I put my fingers through it, it, it drops the illusion. Whereas if I have a force power, or if I'm you know causing something to levitate, or if I'm putting up you know Doctor Strange you know magical <laughs> beams in front of my hands, that works a little more convincingly. Yeah, we've actually been thinking a lot about the design interactions. Um, one of our team members, you know, Jenny Spurlock, she's actually invested a lot in just what are the right gestures? You know, should you actually directly manipulate something, which has challenges though of a, you know, you're, you're physically moving your arm, like will your arm tire out? Mm. Um, is an object actually that at this arm's length distance going to be say, you know, legible based on the focal distance of the headset, mm. or should it be something that's a little bit further out and say, you know, maybe you would ray cast with your hand sort of select something and then do gestures to manipulate. Mm -hmm. So these are actually really open questions. We haven't solved all of it, and I think we're exploring a lot, but as we release the SDK, I think we'll learn a lot about how developers use it. And it sounds like it's the logical next step into incorporating control labs and their kind of hand tracking, their take on it using just neural signals. Yeah, I think there's a lot you can actually do with it and, and how you improve on it, how you add um, sort of fidelity um, to that system. We really think about hands you know, sort of for three key things. Um, the first one is social presence. Just as we interact, having your full hands here versus, say, a controller where you're inferring a lot of your finger presence, um, just hands are strictly better on that. Um, the second one is actually just self-presence. So when I enter, mm -hmm. um, you know, enter VR, today you're just kind of lost without your hands if you're not holding the controllers. And so being able to have your hands in there and then get to controllers is really nice. Um, and the third is just really frictionless input. So as you think about a lot of um, use cases, especially on the enterprise side, being able to just hand a headset, whether it's to a client, to another employee, not worrying about you know, unfastening the wrist, stra you know, the wrist straps, passing over yeah. Oculus Touch, and just having your hands directly in there is just a really seamless experience. Yeah. You meant, I'm curious about the social implications that you mentioned. Are the Horizon avatars being developed with hand tracking in mind? Um, I believe right now they're actually um, being done with the actual controllers in mind. Right. Just because as you think about um, content interactions, you want a lot of that precise input or haptic feedback. So mm -hmm. for now, I think they're focused on the touch. Okay. Side. I mean, it sounds like hand tracking, big investment. You guys have been thinking a long time. You know, Rift S also out this year. Is there any technical limitation preventing Rift S from also getting hand tracking? Um, we focus it right now specifically on Quest. Um, obviously, though, at least there's really sort of two sides to this. One is on the developer side, and the other is on the consumer-facing side. Mm. On the developer side, a lot of people develop on Rift or Rift S and then bring it over to Quest. So we do expect that Rift S will have some sorts of hand tracking support on the developer side, it's just to test things out and ease that development yeah. cycle. But on the consumer side, I think we're really focused on Quest first and foremost and want to see how it does on that platform before but we figure out But it's not because it doesn't have the DSP. Yeah, that. you've got actually the access to even a better, yes. larger yes, camera yes, tracking yes. volume. Yeah. yeah, so. Yeah. And it also sounds like it wasn't that you found the extra headroom in the DSP to enable hand tracking. You knew when you chose that Qualcomm chip that you wanted to leave room for that. Same with the, the camera design, right? Conrad talked about, you know, it's the reason that there's overlap, serial overlap on Quest, because that's going to help with hand tracking. Does that even go forward to more IK? Um, it's actually, it's an open question right now. Um, we did, in the early days, thinking about the camera configurations, we did know that, like, hey, this is a 
a possibility for the future. Especially as we thought about you know, Oculus Go and the media line and really having that frictionless input, this was like a, a core belief that one day we'd be able to deliver on this. And it's, it's actually really mm -hmm. amazing that we're able to do on the Quest timeframe. Um, and you asked about in terms of the compute side, it's actually a, a pretty, I think of it like a, a magical feat of engineering, really, to get that entire hand tracking pipeline onto the DSP, onto the silver cores, and really not impact the content side on the compute. Um, it's a, I am mind blown by what the team has done on that front. That's definitely impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the cameras. You're incorporating Pass Through Plus into the Quest yes. now. Yes. Um, but you won't be able to toggle that on and off at launch. Why is that? Um, we're actually just thinking about the interaction mechanisms that are best and don't uh, conflict or collide with how content does things. So it's really just an exploration right now on what's the best uh, user experience. Okay, so it's not a technical problem. That, okay. Yeah. Is there still any plans to uh, surface the pass through imagery or data or geometry to developers part SDK? Um, we really focus this for now just on the um, the first party and like the safety sides mm. um, with Guardian. But it's a thing in the future that maybe we'll see what makes sense. But um, for now, it's really just focused on safety. The Go apps that you're bringing over to Quest. Yeah. Um, I have some questions about that. Like Carmack said a while ago on Twitter uh, that this was hope you know, he'd hope to bring some sort of Go compatibility layer. Um, is this full-fledged Go comp compatibility in in the sense that it would run anything that you pass at it? It's just that some games run better than others. Yeah. So the real tricky part here is. Um, Depending on when the apps are developed on the different Go APIs, some of them are forward compatible, some of them aren't right. necessarily. Um, and so you get some strange artifacts where um, you, know, you, you might get into a, a title and, and find that the floor is like the wrong location, or that the input um, from the touchpad doesn't mm -hmm. quite necessarily map over to the thumbstick. Right, in the most intuitive th ways. They didn't necessarily have positional tracking in mind when they made those games. That's right. right. That's exactly right. And, um, and so for this reason, we really want to go title by title and make sure that, hey, for these, these first apps of the Go side on the compatibility layer, that they really interacted nicely and as expected. And so we're going through right now that, that whole catalog and library to Got just it. bring over and make sure that they run really well. So do side. some games magically have six degree of freedom head tracking? Uh, some of them will, yes. Okay. Oh. Um, it really just depends on you know how that app was developed, whether or not you know they might have coded around it or like right. you know made different assumptions inside of their implementation. But, okay, but that that won't be surfaced anywhere in the store. You'll just have to find out. Right? Yeah, okay. we're still it's still a work in progress. I right. would say on like the best way for those interactions to look, but. Um, okay. We look forward to feedback. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, John Carmack ended his talk today going through like a big list of all the technical features of hardware as some you would consider because you can't throw everything in a next generation headset. You've made lots of prototypes. And one of the things I noticed from Michael Abrash is showing of the Half Dome 2 and 3 is form factor getting more ergonomic and choosing that as a priority. Is it safe to say that that is, that, that is a precedent going forward that, of size and weight? Um, as opposed to like the biggest FOV and, and it's it's actually a really big tension right now as we think about what the future looks like. Um, so there's a number of considerations. The the first side is we do want to get form factors to be smaller and lighter weight. Like we know that the ergonomic side, our ultimate goal is to get to a pair of glasses. And right. so there's a ton of innovation on that front that we need to make. That actually does though conflict with other goals as you think about let's say adding more sensors, pushing on mixed yeah. reality, all that actually expands your, your volume um, and your power size constraints. Yeah. And really a lot of this is actually just driven by the battery size. Like, can I actually get my whole system to run all these sensors, run all the really the best content, do all the different tracking side scenarios, and be small enough right now to fit into that form factor. And so this is a really big tension that we think about. Mm. I mean, it really boils down to what is this device, you know, what is it being used for, what can it actually do, what's that content that's running on it? And so we try to really balance that whole holistic system around that, that content. In terms of sensors that we don't have yet, eye yeah. tracking, face tracking, the things that they're working on for the future, which, which ones that you've seen prototypes of do you find most compelling personally? They're all pretty magical, actually. Um, and I really think it's, it's um, in the combination of them on a, how do you deliver a greater sense of presence? Like, how do we actually get to that long-term vision that you know, Boz laid out about him and his father feeling like they're in the same room together? Mm -hmm. um, and that level of social presence is going to take a bit of magic. And it's not going to be any single sensor that will be you know, the thing that just like, makes it happen. It's going to be the combination of those sensors and really using them in innovative ways, like using the inside-out tracking sensors for hand tracking. 
sort of not something that a lot of people would have expected. But I think as we get um, all those those different types of options on the headset itself, what we can do on the software side will be pretty magical. Uh, so the shared spaces that you mentioned, uh, where you're sharing a living space with one yeah. another, is that is that truly where one headset and the other headset share the exact same like geometry world understanding? Um, that's an early sort of prototype that we're showing there. Right. Um, that does tie to the idea of live maps, which is one of the long-term investments as we think about how do we actually map the world and get this sort of you know shared understanding. But it's really early right now yeah. in the research phase, so we have to think about yeah exactly and how actually it would roll out to people. Mm -hmm. Horizon seems to be the, the next big social thing. I say next because there's a lot of examples of social experiments and apps that Oculus has put out from rooms to venues to, to right, the spaces, and some of those are going away. As Horizon's being developed, is it something that is just another experiment, or is there is something that's going to get built upon, iterated upon? Like, are we going to see new avatars, different avatars next year? Uh, no, we're really excited about Horizon, and that is sort of the next big investment. It's actually the culmination of a lot of learnings that we had from you know, Facebook Spaces and Oculus Rooms on what people like to do, how they interact, what those different activities that people do together. Mm. And so that's all coming together within Horizon. And the real big part about that is this idea of world building. And yeah. so can I actually build out a world, have you come into this world? Um, it can be something that maybe is just like casual or just hanging out. It can be something more interactive, like an actual mini game that you have there. And so, just seeing what people will do in that space, I think, is really exciting. All right. I mean, I think that covers <laughs> so many of the questions that we had. Thank you so awesome. much, Sean. No, yeah. thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you guys too.